So the first league to come back was the NWSL. They had the Challenge Cup held in Salt Lake City, and the Houston Dash won. And we're going to talk with the goalie who made it happen, Jane Campbell. Jane, how are you tonight? Hey, Jane. Hey, you guys. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Thanks of for course. Being here. Well, thanks. Congratulations on uh, on winning the cup. That was fantastic. But but first, we talk about the tournament. Let's talk about the celebration. That had to be a little yes. unique. The drive drive by celebration, huh? Yeah, it was quite a thank you for um, the congratulations. But uh, yeah, it was quite different. I mean, I think when they told us that week that there was going to be a parade, you know, we all envisioned like the NFL parades or the NBA parades where you've got a bus and you drive around the city and there's all these people. But, um, you know, sure enough, like you said, there was going to be restrictions and they were like, okay, we'll set up a stage for you and then people will drive by essentially. So it was definitely unique, but we heard that there was maybe 450 plus cars there driving through, That's which was awesome. And, um, you know, we obviously were at BBVA, but apparently the line of cars went through in the entire downtown and um, oh, it cool. created, yeah, it created like a big scene. So it was awesome. I mean, Houston was great and uh, they really showed up for the parade. And I know it was like such a weird time. It was a work day and with COVID, everything was going on, but um, the fans were amazing and it was, it was quite special, quite unique also, but, uh, super pumped to be a part of it. I mean, it was yeah, awesome. Yeah, give me the chills. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were kind of like the guinea pigs because you were the first league back. How did this whole experience go inside of, inside being the first ones inside a bubble? Yeah, I think it was definitely, uh, again, unique is the word that just comes to mind when I talk about this stuff. I mean, I don't really know how else to ex uh, describe it. Um, it's just different. I don't think it was what any anyone had imagined. Um, you know, they told us, you know, they gave us this huge packet about like rules and safety measures we have to follow, whether you're staff or a player and, you know, what every day is going to look like and feel like. And, you know, that can only go so far until you're actually in the bubble. So I thought I thought the league did an amazing job putting it together so quickly. I thought, you know, coming in, there was a, a few wrinkles here and there, but I mean, nothing nothing crazy where the bubble completely broke down, which was the goal at the end of the day was to keep the bubble intact. And um, everyone, you know, knock on wood, came out healthy and safe. And we managed to play the entire tournament, no problem. And, um, you know, fortunately we won the whole thing. So I thought it was definitely uh, quite a unique experience. Um, really, really credit to Lisa Baird and the whole NWSL um, staff and also the Utah Royals and the Monarchs for that matter for hosting us. Cause Without them, I mean, I don't know how they would have done it, but it was quite uh, quite unique. But being in the bubble was uh, – it was a long, long tournament, <laughs> it felt like. But, um, Did anybody get you on know, your nerves? Any of your teammates? Like, I'm just sick of seeing you guys. I need a little oh, break. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> when we got home, you know, we flew home. I think it was, like, on a Monday. And, you know, that night everyone's like, all right, you know, let's, you know, let's go get some beers. And everyone's like, no, nope, see ya. You know, <laughs> like, you know, we'll see you tomorrow. Like <laughs> – we just, you know, we just celebrated for 24 hours straight. You know, we don't need to do it for another 24. <laughs> now, the soccer is such a, a passionate sport. The fan base, and your, yours, no, no exception, the fan base is so enthusiastic. And the fan base can have an, an influence on a game. Like, you see teams that never lose at home that really aren't even that good at teams. How weird is it not playing with any fans? Yeah, um, I think that was a huge factor as well. I mean, you think of the Portland Thorns who – you know, on a bad day, get like 20,000 fans. And, right, um, right. you know, that fan base for sure was, I think, greatly missed by their organization, but by the whole league as well. I mean, um, our fans, I mean, I'm I'm pretty biased, but I think playing at BBVA with our fans is the best setup. And I think we have the best stadium, we have the best grass. So um, co going to a bubble where you're playing on turf for the most of the tournament, and then it's you know, you can hear a pin drop. I mean, you can hear someone cough, like, you know, d being the camera guy. It's like, okay, well, who's this guy, you know? And um, it was definitely quite interesting. But I think at the end of the day, when we all started to, you know, after the first game, that was definitely probably the weirdest game, just because we didn't really know what to expect. And it was wicked quiet. And you could hear everything from the coaches coaching the other team and sharing tactics, the subs, to the refs, to almost everything you could hear in the stadium. So um, it was definitely different. But I think after the first game, people kind of just threw that away. And, you know, at the end of the day, you have a task at hand, and that's to win the game, whether there's, you know, 20, 30,000 people in the stands or there's no one. So um, we also knew going in that the viewership online was going to be probably much higher than it usually would be for a normal season game. And I think 
to mm-hmm. us, we kind of took that as like, okay, can we show not just Houston, but can we show kind of the country and almost the world, whoever's tuning in that, hey, this league is functioning, we're performing at a high level and we can come out and win this thing. So um, for us, we knew people were watching. We just, you know, we knew that they weren't there physically with us. Right now, it was such a successful month. Has there been talk about maybe having another tournament, you know, before the end of the year? Yeah, there's definitely been rumors and definitely talks. And, um, you know, I know the MLS is trying to continue their season doing just individual games and traveling to and from um, the host city. And there's also been rumors of that. But um, to be quite frank, we haven't heard anything concrete. Um, the tournament itself, I think, was a huge, huge, huge success. And the fact that we did it in a safe manner and we were able to get all games played without any postponements or any cancellations. I think that's a huge, huge positive for the league in general. So maybe even not even this year, but maybe next year, there could potentially be another tournament style where, you know, Hey, maybe there's a break in the season. We can go play a mini tournament just to get something different. But um, I wish I knew what was going on the rest of 2020, but as of right now, we haven't heard anything. All right. I have a, uh, I have a technical question for you because I am, okay. uh, I am also part of the goalkeepers union. I played. Yeah, I am. I am also part of the goalkeepers union. There we go. <laughs> yeah. I, was, uh, I was a goalie in Europe. I was. Uh, I was uh, chosen by PSG's uh, youth team. No way! Uh, that's awesome. I'm not going to age myself, uh, to, like, <laughs> but, but he's old. Yeah. I'm old. I've seen, I've seen the goaltending position change so much over the last 25 to 30 years, and there's yeah. one specific thing is cutting down the angle. I see goalies come out so far out of the box now, out of the six yards box. And the way you guys, with the new balls, first of all, that came in about 10, 15 years ago, and the power of the shots on any given Saturday or Sunday when I'm watching soccer, at least half of the goals, if the goalie was two, three, four, five feet back, he would have or she would have that extra, just that fraction of a second, take that extra step, get a hand on it, get a kick on it, a foot on it. I just I wonder why sometimes they're out near the penalty spot, you know, and there's a defenseman who's coming for help. What is your thought process on cutting down the angle that much? Um, I think it just depends on the situation of the game, right? If if someone I mean, what I've been taught in the pro level compared to maybe the college game or even my club level uh, in the college game, I think athletic wise, regardless of my position, I was probably one of the most athletic people on the field at any given game. So I think in the college game, I got away with a ton of things where my rookie right. year in the pro game, I, I didn't get away with it. I mean, Rachel Daly was with me my rookie year and, you know, she would just ping balls by me left, right and center. And now I was just like, okay, there's clearly a different strategy now and a different mindset from her as a field player and as well as myself as a keeper. So I think, um, you know, I've been taught in the pro game, you know, the further away the shooter is, the more you should be hugging your line. Um so, you know, if they're 18 plus, you should probably be hugging your line. If they're kind of if they're going to start creeping in, then you can go ahead and creep out. But, um, you know, you see in the men's game, it's interesting. I've had a debate with a few of my friends back at home who help train me and they're on the men's side. And, you know, you see so that some of the MLS keepers, they're out, you know, sometimes six, seven yards yeah. for a shot that might be, you know, might be 16 yards away. And then, you know, the coach would always come back at me and be like, oh, we never want you to do that. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. You know, it's like. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you just wonder why, and it's always trial and error. So I do agree with you. The game has definitely changed um, now that we're like this modernized sweeper keeper, essentially. Right, um, right, I, right. Do, I do think there's pros and cons for sure to both. And uh, I just think the biggest change in the whole entire game is just the pace at which the ball is coming at you now. And um, I think, like you said, if you were able to hold, you get more of a reaction time, but sometimes you don't get that and you'll have to cut the angle. So I do, I do think it's an interesting debate. So um, I hear your point for sure. And especially uh, when the ball's doing this now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So in my, uh, day, great... my day, it just went, you know, there was none of this. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Great. It's a great debate, I think. And uh, I love debating it because, you know, I'm always like, well, if the guys can do it, then like, why couldn't I, you know? And yeah. even though there may be six, four, six, five, and I'm only five, nine, it's like, well, comparatively to the female side, I'm probably one of the tallest, you know, and so are they from men? You know, it's interesting. It's just a very interesting debate. And like you said, it, it, for some keepers, it's probably just personal preference, just what they feel comfortable for with. Sure. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, and you had three straight clean sheets in the in the cup, so you're obviously doing something right. You know what you're doing. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'll have to credit that to uh, the back line for sure. They played an amazing tournament, so uh, hats off to them. I mean, that was all them for sure. Uh, spoken like a true teammate. Yeah, I yeah, that is. Still, I got I got carded once for berating my own defender. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, but uh, before we let you go, I just want to talk about you are a part of the uh, World Cup uh, bid committee for Houston for the 2026. Uh, World yeah. Cup, you know, with a uh, you know North America forming, I guess, an alliance with Canada, Mexico, and, and the U.S. Uh, talk about what Houston would bring to the tournament. Yeah, I think it's you know it's quite a incredible experience for me to join. One as someone who's 25, and two, I'm still playing. So joining this board of you know mainly CEOs and Demarcus Beasley will be there, who has just retired with the Dynamo and. Obviously, he's been uh, an incredible, incredible player. So um, I just think Houston, we essentially have everything that one would need to host. Um, our stadium, I think, is, again, I might be biased, but I think it's top-notch in the, in the U.S. I think travel-wise, it's easy. We have two airports that are right there. Hotel, we've got best hotels, and we've got arguably, I think, the best sports market in the country with how many organizations we have right in Houston. So um, I just think it's a growing city. Um, the culture's growing, it's young, and it's diverse. And I think what a better way to, one, grow the soccer culture, but also just grow the sports culture in general uh, in Houston by bringing a World Cup bid. I mean, that would just be an incredible, incredible feat. So I hope we can do it. Right. And it would be very important to have, I guess, a team, a you know, city in Texas closer to Mexico. So you, you, you exactly merge it would be a good uh, strategic location. And you can invite Astro players to bang on garbage cans to make noise during the game. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, my gosh, bring them all, you know. Yeah. But that, now being in Houston now, like, um, what's the city like, for, you know, for baseball? How, how, how has it, like, been, you know, the, the response of all the yeah. backlash? I think it's, uh, you know, it's pretty tough. Um, obviously, we haven't been able to go to any games because of right. COVID. And um, we know they just kicked off or, you know, had their first game, I think, maybe a week or two ago. Um, so, I don't know. I think it's interesting. You know, even in our own city, we've I've seen, you know, signs or shirts that, you know, hint at the trash can thing or, um, you know, the sign stealing thing or, or whatever it may be. So, that's a bit... Uh, you know, disheartening. But at the end of the day, I mean, um, I'm such a Houston fan, so I, I have full faith in them that they'll be able to get their reputation back. And uh, it might take a while, but um, my gosh, they've got some incredible athletes and incredible players um, on that team and in that organization. So I support them 100%. And, uh, you know, go Astros. Bang on some trash cans. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But, uh, but Jane, this was fantastic. Congratulations once again, and uh, good luck with the committee bid. And hopefully, um, World Cup in Houston. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Awesome. Thank you yeah. guys so much. Thank you for having me.